July 2001. Hunt Valley Inn in Baltimore was the setting for an eclectic mix of genre stars, including Hammer's Barbara Shelley, Yvonne Monlar, and Veronica Carlson. But one of the most memorable talks was with the original Seymour and Audrey, Jonathan Hayes and Jackie Joseph, stars of Roger Corman's 1960 classic, Little Shop of Horrors. The film also featured a young Jack Nicholson as a masochistic dental patient. Jonathan and Jackie were two of the most amiable guests who ever attended Fanex. Jonathan Hayes was a longtime AIP player with titles such as X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes, The Terror, The Saga of the Viking Women and Their Voyage to the Waters of the Great Sea Serpent, Not of This Earth, and It Conquered the World on his resume. Jackie Joseph has over 80 movie and television credits, including providing voices for the cartoons Scooby-Doo and Josie and the Pussycats in Outer Space. She also portrayed Sheila Futterman in Joe Dante's Gremlins and Gremlins 2. In those films, she was married to another AIP alum, Dick Miller as Murray Futterman. But to us, the dynamic duo of Jackie and Jonathan will always be Seymour and Audrey. This will come as a great surprise to you. <laughs> but this is the voice I use. <laughs> but Jonathan. I used the same voice she used. Yeah. I, I said, um, I didn't mean it. <laughs> but, I even heard it. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, basically, I don't remember what I said in the movie. Mm -hmm. But I used, uh, yeah, kind of a, I don't know, strange, kind of weird voice. Mm -hmm. How often, do, it's your claim to fame, I'm afraid, for better or worse. How often do either of you see the movie? Lately, I saw it once. Um, well, I've seen it several times. But uh, I, I think within the last 10 years, I've only seen it once. Mm -hmm. But someone gave me a, a video. This sounds so awful, but it made me so happy because because I was in the picture. Oh, on the packaging. <laughs> on the packaging, yeah. They have so many with Jack Nicholson, or, and, and uh, so it was. It was really a shot, I think, of the two of us. Uh, uh, so I love having the video and really acknowledging that. that I have to tell you, it's really hard to sit and watch yourself. Not only is it hard to watch yourself, it's hard to watch yourself 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Well, see, I don't think it's that hard. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I think I, I'm so far away from that little girl that I keep saying, look at that cute little girl. You know, and you don't associate with being yourself because it's so far removed from the life you're living. And, and also, she was a littler girl, so it's hard to really think it was me. But, uh, you know, it does bring the whole experience back. And, and it was an experience as opposed to just a job. Well, it did bring my hair back. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a red wig in the lobby, I know. <laughs> but, but, yes. but uh, Jonathan and I first met um, when we got together to memorize the movie before we hit the set because we realized we only had two days to make the film and so we better know our words and we just drummed and drummed. I had come back from New York. I was doing uh, a show in New York and uh, we came back and then I came we back. We worked together about a week. Well Long yeah because we worked with each other and then just went in and it was full speed ahead. <laughs> yes. We never had time to do anything but just work. You know, all the interior scenes in the movie were done in those two days. They were like 20-hour days. And uh, then we went out on the streets and did three nights of second unit with a total different crew, diff a total different world. And uh, it, was, it was insane. We were, we were shooting on, actually on Skid Row 
using real bombs. As <laughs> 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 We were paying these bums 10 cents a walkthrough, you know, to walk through the sea. And they'd, do, they'd want their dime as soon as they walked through. They had a guy standing there giving them a dime. So they, these guys would make three walkthroughs, they'd get 30 cents, and they'd go to a liquor store and buy a jar of bulk wine for 30 cents, drink it down, and come back and do three more walkthroughs. Yeah, a little too okay. But uh, a stagger through about that time. Yeah. <laughs> It was filmmaking really at its basis. Yeah. I mean, I remember changing my costume in a carpenter's booth on the set because you didn't have time to go to a dressing room. So you just like ran to the booth, threw on your other dress, and <coughs> ran to the other set that was pre-lit. It was all ready. There was no hanging around in this picture. And when they shot it, it's the first experience I ever had, and I think it was way ahead of its time, was they used four cameras. No, we used three cameras. Three cameras? I, th I thought I remembered four. No, no, no. Well, I can't remember anything. But, um, Roger got three for the price of two. It was, it, I think the only show that did that was the Lucy, Lucy and Walt show. At that time. The I Love Lucy. And uh, because movies, they never did that. And they, and they still don't. But, and if indeed you're talking and there was a huge shadow of a microphone in front of your face, too bad. <laughs> no time to fix it. And uh, we were just talking the other day. I, I hadn't done a lot of movies, and so I really trusted that I was the actress, and whoever else did their job were the important professionals on the set. And I really wanted to look good because it was such an important part. I thought I should look like a girl that he would be in love with. And the makeup man was this funny little guy wore a little hat, and um, I thought, well, this is a movie makeup man, so I will trust him, because he knows the medium, and I was watching in a mirror as my eyebrows were getting bigger, and, <laughs> and, and so I very calmly said, you know, do you do very many women? <laughs> and he said, well, no, I've never done one before, I only do monsters. <laughs> Tissued it down a little bit, so um, you know it, it, it makes you clammy to think about it. <laughs> does, does anybody have a specific question? Because we can wrap up. Did you guys uh, stick very tightly to the dialogue in the script, or were you able to ad lib anything with that great? I think, thing? as far as I was concerned, I did the words. Yeah, I think we did too. I mean, occasionally we would throw in something if, if we thought of it, but it wasn't the way we worked. Right. We worked from the script. Mm -hmm. uh, we were looser on the second units, actually, because it was a lot of chases, and right. they would find places that looked good to go chasing through, mm -hmm. and uh, they'd do it, you know, or they'd think of jokes as we were doing it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were going down the street, and they decided they wanted, I was running away from everybody, they decided I was going to hide in a hearse. Mm -hmm. So they went into a funeral parlor, and made a deal to use a hearse. And they got a hearse with a dead body, a real dead body. And so I came over and I opened the door and there was a real dead body. In there. Apparently, they wouldn't rent it to them without the body because they had to take it out of it. <laughs> but that didn't make the final cut, did it? I don't think that yeah, was Yeah, there's the scene. I run up to the hearse, I open the door, oh, and I run right away. Yeah. But there was actually a body in there. Just lay <laughs> We worked very hard with the script before we even went to shoot the right. movie, and it was it was a well written, if not unusual, script. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we were just talking that, that one of Roger Corman's real skills here, even though he was swift and sometimes you know uh, cheaper Thrift. than thrifty, yeah, very, Thrift. very <laughs> cautious with the with the uh, funds. Um, he carefully picked out people who were actors and who he could trust would come up to the uh, standard of, of necessity, that we would know our part, that we would do the performing, and, uh, and that we played it honestly. It's like we really believed 
what we had to say to each other. We really just were impassioned and shyly, desperately enamored with each other. And, uh, and you don't have to try and be funny in, in a, uh, a thing like that. And that was the sweetness of it. Well, it was very naive. I mean, there was nothing in there that wasn't simple and pure and, and naive, you know? <laughs> they don't make movies like that. <laughs> oh, that's true, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I, I had often wondered how Roger even cast me in the picture. And uh, because that's the only time I ever did a film for him. Because of his genre, he used glamorous cobra women and, and uh, you know, people who were very, you know, uniquely... Roger, but uh, he was looking for a, a specific quality, and either he saw some Arkoff film I did prior to that, or uh, I was in theater for quite a few years doing a musical review where I was the ingenue, and so, so all the all the bits I did were were nice people, and, and so there was some quality of innocence that he told me he he wanted innocence for Audrey. Because she had to be pretty innocent just to sort of go along with everything <laughs> that was happening there and say, oh, that's nice. Oh, the medicine for dinner, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just was a, a lucky moment in, in my checkered career to have popped into this movie. So. Well, it seems like everything just came together right. You know how sometimes it just all works for you. Some days you get home runs, some days you strike out. Well, that was a home run situation. And we were shooting it on the stage that Charlie Chaplin used to make his films on. Wow. Which maybe there was some kind of spiritual ghost or something that affected us all. But it, it is magical. And not only is it magical, you can't really put your finger on what makes it wonderful. I mean, it's certainly not Chuck Griffith's writing. It isn't Roger's directing. It certainly isn't my performance, her performance. It's just all of it seems to have gelled into this weird mess. <laughs> Everybody took it so seriously, this ridiculous thing. I mean, with, with the worst prop plant ever seen. <laughs> you know, well, it did not stage it, did it? No. And, and that you actually would look at this with, in terror, as if it was, you know, anything but a piece of foam. <laughs> You know, somebody came with a quick spray can, and <laughs> as it got bigger, they were saying, well, let's pop on these fake-looking faces. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it wouldn't have worked had it been real. Yeah, it, it, it had to It not wouldn't be have fit in that flower shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it just was accidentally cool, you know, and, um, and, and throughout our lives, you know, if you'd be in a drive-in restaurant or something, and you'd hear from the car next to you, <laughs> True. You just had to get used to wherever you were going, someone would look at you and say, feed me. <laughs> yes. I didn't know if they were hungry or saw the movie. <laughs> no, they were loving you from afar. <laughs> well, how come you guys are all here? Oh, it's a <laughs> Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm, my name's Bobby. I'm from Rhode Island. Uh, the reason I like the movie, the reason why it impressed me, it had a very indelible uh, marking on my psyche because I saw it in the theater when I was a kid, and it really, really scared me, uh, especially the end part, whenever the faces came out. Oh, yeah. Because I was young at the time, and I saw it, and, you know, I laughed at the funny parts, but it really, really scared me, and... Uh, the whole idea back then of a plant eating dead bo eating bodies that you had to go out and get the bodies uh, and, and feed it live blood was actually pretty scary at the time uh, for me. Um, I know now looking back on it, it's supposed to be a comedy. And <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Yeah, well, and look where it brought you today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it was outrageous comedy for its time. Yeah. Nobody would think of making a movie like that. Except Roger at that time. <laughs> well, he had done Bucket of Blood a right. uh, year or two before. And uh, I know that I was in New York when I got the call. I just finished doing the show I was doing and was called to do a detective movie. And, and during the
the time I flew across the country, they had written the plant movie. And as we realized it today, that it's kind of the common. Well, you know, the original title of the movie when we were making it was The Passionate People Eater. Oh. <laughs> that's interesting. That's, I have the original script, and that's the title. Of that's it. Right. Oh, wow. That's, right. yeah, that's neat. Well, <laughs> yeah. Just getting away from Little Shop for just a second, I know that after Corman started making the Edgar Allan Poe pictures, that you worked behind the scenes on a lot of them. I did, yes. And I was wondering if you had any memories of uh, Price and Karloff and Peter Laurie and people like that. Well, mainly, yes. Uh, Peter and Laurie and I became very good friends because Roger insisted I stay right with Peter because Peter couldn't remember lines. Mm -hmm. And so constantly I worked with him on his lines. And every day he used to get a delivery from Schwab's drugstore, like a big box of medicine. I don't know what he was thinking, but he was feeling no pain, believe me. <laughs> Vincent Price was really a gentleman and funny, very funny. And he played all these serious roles, but he was really a comic at heart. And uh, behind the, the set and everything, he was a joker you could not believe. And a lovely man. So he was great. Who else? I worked with Basil Rathbone. Again, tremendous gentleman. Tremendous. Really beautiful guy. And these old these guys were middle-aged men at the time. I was a really young guy. And they were all guys that I had seen in the movies since I was a kid. And I was, I was just so impressed to be in the same room with them. You know? It was wonderful. Were you, did you work on any Karloff was in? Ka yes, I worked on The Terror. Mm -hmm. with Ka I acted in The Terror. Right. Oh, with right. Jack Nicholson mm -hmm. and uh, Boris Karloff and Jack's wife at the time, Sandra, whatever her name was, mm -hmm. Sandra Nicholson. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> that was an interesting picture because Roger had shot, shot part of it in Europe. <laughs> and then he came back and wrote him the rest of the movie. And uh, I, on location. I played a guy that was a, a deaf mute up until the end of the movie, but he couldn't figure a way to explain the way out of the movie, and I talked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but first, first day he had a bird peck my eyes out. I think that's what cured my voice. But, uh, yeah. Ouch! Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. I, I was the one that revealed all the secrets, and I had never spoken in a movie before. I played Gustav. I was a uh, an assistant to a witch. Maybe she made me talk. I don't know. <laughs> what, what I always think is so funny when I hear uh, Jonathan or Dick Miller getting together and talking about their early Corman days was how many parts they played in the same movie. That, right. In Apache Woman, we played cowboys and Indians. <laughs> because it was cheaper to have us change our wardrobe than to bring in two more actors. <laughs> so there's a scene where we're having this big gunfight, and we're shooting at the Indians, and here we are, the Indians getting shot. <laughs> and the makeup wasn't that good that you didn't know it. <laughs> but Roger didn't care. We made the movie, he sold it, we made money, he was happy. So it was interesting, though, to suddenly be an Indian and you're shooting at yourself as a cowboy. <laughs> I don't know so much as, as that he didn't care. It's that oh, no, he it cared. just didn't matter. He just thought, so, okay, we've done it. Next. He was basically into page count. <laughs> you know, he had to get his pages done for the day. He did. And, and Roger himself, I know a lot of you met him last year, but uh, I always thought of him as... Uh, an aristocrat. He has this, this elegance about him, and I think he lives a more uh, genteel life. You know, he, he's really you know kind of a fine gentleman, and then has made all these. Well, not I mean not that they're not fine, but not really genteel movies. <laughs> so he was a great contradiction. I thought a very interesting man uh, for who he was and what he did. It, uh, very unusual. And then he started doing things that were a little more upscale, or, or tried to. Right, after I left. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> now we can get to the stylish stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, that, then he had money to make bigger movies. That's true. That's and true. That, he made a deal with Fox to do two movies or something. It's funny. I remember, you know, when you're on the set, you're close to 
some other movie that's gone on or just gone on. And, and Ed Nelson, who was not in our movie, but just had finished some other movie, was having some ferocious annoyance going on because the movie he did, the, the meals that got served were on used TV trays. He said, this is outrageous, you know? TV dinner. Yeah, old, yeah. old TV dinners, but used, you know, <laughs> they, they like dipped the trays and they didn't wipe the crust off the muffin or something. It was just, <laughs> and he was just, that something in him, even in his sweet youth, felt outrage. <laughs> you know, we should be treated better. But um, that's before the contracts got, you know, a little more tender to the actors. In fact, we were just talking that we finished Little Shop about a few minutes before the the contract of 1960 came into play, where actors had to get residuals for performing, and so I think he quickly scheduled this movie just to be shot. Just be, I, think, I think on New Year's Eve, you know, we were working very heavily just just before it turned into 1960. Mm. So. Uh, we miss those uh, legal residuals, but events like this have been residuals we never even dreamed of. You know, uh, the main reason that Roger made the movie in two days of principal photography was because these sets were standing on the stage at, at uh, Chaplin Studios. And Roger made a deal with, with somebody at Chaplin Studios that if he could use the sets for two days, that he would pay the price of striking the sets. <laughs> And that's how we got on those sets, and that's why it was two days. I think it was his brother's set. Gene Corman had just I'm finished sure. something, and I'm so sure. he was just sitting there, and they thought, well, let's quickly shut down another movie. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's why the movie was written in about a week, and we had about a week to get it ready and win and do it. Two days to do it. It was over before we felt like we even started. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it took quite a while for us to realize it was going to make a mark in this world. Or that anybody would ever want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it opened as a second feature. And a few people saw it, but it didn't become popular until about five years later when word of mouth had spread on it. And also, somehow Mel Wells got it invited to the Cannes Festival as an invited screening. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they screened it at the Cannes Festival, and that's when the rest of the world found out about it. And also it became popular with a lot of the American filmmakers who were around at the time. But uh, that's when, five years afterwards, people started recognizing us. And I'm just like being a mommy or something. <laughs> you don't even know this is happening. But um, Wow. I mean, it wasn't in contention. It was just there as an invited screen. Yeah. Well, it, it is funny. We uh, just last year went to some little mountain village up uh, in, in uh, Provence. You know, you go up the hills and suddenly we're in this little place called Tourette's Serlou, just above Vance. And, and someone goes, oh, this is a <laughs> it was around Halloween, they were getting really excited, you know, and it uh, seems they had just recently had a screening in France, and I thought, wow, you never know. It's, it's strange, I still get fan mail from all over the world for that movie. I get 10, 15 letters a month from wow. people that are just discovering the movie now, in Germany, in Russia, <laughs> weird. People write me these letters. That's very strange. Wait. 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 If you were normal people, why would I be here? <laughs> well, thank God, you know, if we weren't weird, how boring it would be. <laughs> you know, if it's dubbed in those foreign languages, that would be hysterical to hear. Uh, I wonder. French or German. I do have a colorized version that somebody <clears throat> sent me. Wow. That's really weird. <laughs> and I don't know whether they dub it or they put yeah. subtitles, subtitles on it. I don't know. Mm. I would think it would be funny to see it in a foreign language. Yeah, yeah definitely. It would be funny to see it with subtitles, too, you know, because it elevates it to a certain level. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's now a film. <laughs> you know, who knew? Somebody said that, that, you know, now these are on uh, DVDs and... Uh, 
that we thought the three cameras were, were really advanced <laughs> technology, and now, now uh, does anybody want to ask how old we are? No. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Um, what do you guys think of the remake? It's big. The plant's great. <laughs> I have to say, I really, really have great affection for the musical on stage. Mm -hmm. I thought the stage musical was wonderful, and I thought Ellen Green was delicious. Just a wonderful, wonderful performance. And I, and I remember thinking while watching the show, she had more time to put on her makeup than I had doing the whole thing. <laughs> and their plant cost more than our entire movie. But I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it translated to the screen. I don't, I won't say as, well, as good as our movie, because that was a unique thing. I don't think it translated as well as the, the musical production. Mm. So, you know, for the next advanced step, I, th I picked the stage version over the movie version. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. What do you think? Um, well, I'll tell you the truth, uh, that was, your version was the one that I discovered after having seen the, the second one. So I, I thought it was cute, you know, sort of a musical type thing, and 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 then when I saw yours, I was like, oh, because I started getting into this genre a lot later. And well, then it served its purpose. Yeah, and and it was great, and, and actually it was fun. Um, it was fun putting the clips together, um, finding those little pieces of the Did movie you that do were. That? Yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. That was very good. The Clipper. Yeah. Uh, the Clipper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Cindy, um, I I too saw the other movie first. Uh, my sister had told me she had seen your movie uh, on a late night thing one night and she said, you got to see this movie, it's really great. But I saw the other one first and she's the one who got me to the theater to see it and of course it had a lot of buzz about it. But I did see that other movie, I thought it was cute, I thought it was fun and then one day I went out and rented your movie and put it in the VCR and I was just dazzled by it. I just, it was, it was like a totally different level from the other movie. It was just, there was something totally magical about the film that you guys did. And I, I agree, we can't really put our finger exactly on what it is that makes that movie just so wonderful, but it really is. It's the ensemble, it's the way yeah. we yes. all work together. Yes, yes. It yeah. did, it all came together, and, and it was great having Dick Miller just hanging yeah. around munching on the That's hilarious. <laughs> Do you know but, if they did that on purpose, um, after a little show? I really think they did. Oh, yeah. I, I think that, they, that, the, that the producers, who were probably young at the time, thought, wouldn't it be funny to use those weird people in our movies? <laughs> I mean, I can't think of any other reason they picked us up. They, they, we did interview, you know, they just wanted to see if we could still talk. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I think that's the only reason that, that we were cast. I mean, Joe Dante is, comes from there. To, nicest man in the world. That's cool. And just giving Joe a plug here. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. yeah, Joe minds the, the Corman ensemble frequently. I mean, uh, the two of you, uh, and also I think um, the guy who was in the, uh, the, the gas station in Gremlins also uh, is, a, is a Corman actor. I can't think of his name. The guy in the gas station. I didn't even see the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't think of No, I didn't work on that, but I always... Anyway, red-haired actor, and anyway. And uh, which movie was it? No, it may not have been. It may not have been a Corman guy. I'm sorry. It was. Kenneth some... Toby. Yeah. No. Okay. Oh. I'm so glad we didn't pretend to know what you were talking about. <laughs> 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 anyway, he's a big he's a big fan of old '50s movies and '60s movies, and so you know he grabs all these people. But yeah, he's, he. Um... Anyway. Well, there was a, an interesting pool of people, and uh, luckily I got to dip my toe in. You know, that was about my 
last picture with Roger. I did only one movie after that with him. And that was uh, X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes. Oh. I did a, Dick and I did a little number in there. And The Terror. The Terror, yes. But The Terror, I think we, we had shot part of that before, I think. And I think that it, it wasn't totally put together until after. Hmm. But I think the filming we did before had been. Uh, it was a very interesting time. Actors really had a had a chance in those days, you know? I mean, it wasn't as tough. Today, there's zillions of actors. Auditions, they bring in 300 people for a first call, and then they bring back 20 people for a second call, and they bring back five people for a third call, and they pick one out of the original 300. And uh, I go through that process about three times a week, you know? <laughs> on commercials particularly. Wow. They look at a zillion people. I guess it's the only way the advertising agencies can justify their being in California for two weeks or whatever. <laughs> they just work you to death, you know, and, and they have to call back and say, oh, we saw 300 people, but none of them were right. Now, what's right, you know? <laughs> the fun part of doing that is uh, when we go out on in interviews, you get to see your colleagues that you haven't seen for years. And you see the other performers, and you know you start thinking, "Wow, they're coming for an interview. This is the movie star." <laughs> I mean, I was I was sitting in a little office, and I saw a familiar woman, and suddenly I thought, "That's Joan Leslie." Oh, wow. Joan Leslie was a huge movie star. You know, she was she was in Yankee Doodle Dandy. I mean, this is, <laughs> and and here she is sitting, waiting, you know, to audition <laughs> for some commercial. You, you meet a lot of nifty people. Good old friends, old husband. <laughs> 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 yeah. Somebody asked me about him. Uh, in case you don't know, my ex-husband, uh, the tap dancer and good actor, his name is Ken Berry. Yeah. And oh, yeah. he is very well now. He, he had a little surgery last year. Somebody else asked about him. But he's good. He's good. He's fine. Nice man. Yeah. What, what led you into uh, cartoons? Doing cartoons. Oh, when did I start? Yeah, well, well, I mean, how did you Yeah, How did you get in, involved in doing that? Uh, it's the luckiest thing that ever happened, because, especially when you're a mommy, because you're very busy. In a cartoon, you're, maybe you're, if you've worked two hours, you've had a long day. And you don't have to, you could, you could have a bandana on and no makeup and a moo moo and go <laughs> in and be anybody. But uh, the happiest cartoon I did was Josie and the Pussycats. And you audition for that like anything else, only it's just on recording. And thank God CBS picked me off that. And uh, Hanna Barbera was such a high tone cartoon place to work. And uh, you get to work with great actors. You know, they you read through it once. They give you the script, and uh, maybe the director will finesse it a little and say, you know, what he wants punched, and you underline this. And this is when everybody has. To Beat the crowd and go, oh my gosh, what you, what's happening? And there's all this buzz and just all that silly stuff because you play more than one character quite often and you're always the crowd. Uh, and then you stand up at microphones and, and you're with people like, well, Janet Waldo, who was a great radio actress. You're, you're too old, young, but she was Corliss Archer. And, you know, radio to me was wonderful. And, and Casey Kasem mm -hmm. was in uh, Josie and the Pussycats. And, Casey, you know, he would work and would, his arms would be flailing. <laughs> Everybody was acting in their own style. And, and, and I'm a hands person myself, so I had to be careful not to hit the microphone or flail the papers because we have to be quiet, but, except for our voices. But uh, animation was fun. I got to do school. It's also great because you don't have to learn the lines. No, like, no, you've got memory. A piece of paper and oh, yeah. It is the most mindless. <laughs> All you have to do is really believe you're this drawing. You know, and, and my kids believed it. You know, they never commented on anything I did, but they'd watch Josie and the Pussycats. And, like, maybe Melody could be running and not saying anything, and she'd trip over a rock and I'd look up dumbly, and they'd say, Oh, Mom, you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, and thank you. Thank you, illustrators. You know, but, yeah. Uh, that, that, that also is an interesting venue to work in because at some point, the people in charge think, well, you're older now, 
So we have to find the younger voices. And we think, That's silly. Yeah, what if we turned around and we weren't looking at us? You know? <laughs> we are the same voices. You know? I, don't, I don't think we aged up too much in, in, in the voices. So uh, it's just a, you know, a natural progression. It, they, they just, the seniors are not really popular in, in the current world of working. But uh, animation is, is uh, well, I love doing that. What was that funny thing with fish? It called the, it did, I don't know, it made me laugh. But the, the Scooby um, did, did a series on the Popeye Hour called Dinky Dog. And uh, that was really fun. We're not talking about horror movies. Is that OK? Mm -hmm. like, I, I asked the question, so no That's problem. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Barbera especially was a very elegant social life in Beverly Hills. And, but for the first reading, along with the people from CBS, and uh, the first actor who played Dinky Dog, uh, he had to be replaced the year after because, well, because he died. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was a giant. His name was Ted Cassidy, a very oh, yeah, nice yeah. man. And they were deciding at the table, the tone of voice was before we went into recording uh, the series, how the dog should sound. And all the executives who were around the table were saying, well, I think he should kind of speak, but like he was a dog saying, well, I don't like that. <laughs> and then some other very elegant man was saying, oh, I don't think so. He should be going, <laughs> and I'm just watching all these people like, well, no, it should really be <laughs> Okay, it's, it's, a, it's an amusing world. <laughs> and, and, and my main thing to do was to giggle, you know, where I could just say some line and go, <laughs> you know, that they thought, oh, that's really, very good. So, um, you know, my kingdom for some more of that now. But, uh, did you have another question, Tom? Yeah, when we, when we spoke, you mentioned briefly a TV show Alakazam you did in the 50s. You just gave me the tiniest little idea of The what magic you did on land that. of Alakazam. Yeah, I was wondering what exactly you did on that show. I was a magician's helper. Mm -hmm. And it was Mark Wilson and his wife, the enchanting Nani Darnell. <laughs> that was how they built her. And their son, Mike. Uh, who was a little blonde guy who was now like a very famous magician. But it was a, a national uh, weekend show on CBS. And another girl and I had little green satin costumes. And we would like say, here's a hanky. You know, we didn't say anything, but you know, exactly. Because <laughs> if we spoke, they had to pay us more than $40 a show. So we were the silent helpers, <coughs> except when they sawed somebody in half, you're really lying in a box with your feet up like this. <laughs> then it's your legs, and they'll tickle the enchanting Nani Darnell, and she'll go, oh, <laughs> your legs are kicking. And, and uh, once, oh, the scariest thing happened. They had some illusion. They called it a switch. And enchanting Nani was wearing like a, a harem outfit. And so I'm ready to make the switch when she accidentally you know, does some flourishing move, and I flourish out onto lying down on this thing that they make elevate. And it elevates all the way into the wings, and then she makes this magical appearance from the back of the house. During the rehearsal for that, I'm elevated in my hair and garb, and they broke for lunch and left me <laughs> hanging in the ceiling of CBS. <laughs> and, and I, you can't like look over because you'll fall off these little stilts and strings you're lying on. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't think of harnesses or anything. There was no time, and I'm going, "Hello, <laughs> is anybody there? I'm in the sky." <laughs> it's a very funny world, of magicians. And, and any trick that we had uh, no physical part in, any illusion uh, during that point of rehearsal, we had to turn our back. So, oh, wow. Because they thought, like, the first thing we're going to do when we go home is, where do you hear how they did this? <laughs> like we cared. Got to do shopping and the dishes. <laughs> they are protective, though. They're very protective. Very protective. Of their yeah. tricks. But uh, they, they're very sweet now. They still are very big in the illusion world. And anytime I want to go to the Magic Castle, I just call Enchanting Honey. And <laughs> she leaves me a pass. So, so that, you know, it, it's, uh, again, a checkered world. 
any other piece of the, the puzzle you want filled in? <laughs> Have we talked your ears off? At what point during the uh, uh, project on Little Shop did you first hear the music, which I thought was amazing? Did you we not never hear it? Heard. You never heard it until it was out and done, yeah. Until we saw it. Until yeah. so the final uh, cut came out. Well, you saw the final cut. I believe so. I didn't see it until I went to pay and see it in a movie. <laughs> 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 and I was so excited, that, and I had a girlfriend who said, You're excited about this? <laughs> you know, I thought. <laughs> um, as, as actors, um, do, you, do you get surprised when you actually see the final product? Because, you know, when you're in the middle of the, the acting, it, it probably can't seem like it does when you, when you actually see the finished version. Well, I was surprised because I didn't see all the stuff they did uh, running at night, you know, and popping out of tires and toilet seats. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. <laughs> little secrets from, from the girls. You know, I don't think if, if you work on a movie and, and you're in it, particularly as an actor, that you ever see it really right. I mean, you're never an audience. Mm. Even though you can sit in an audience and look at it, you're not looking at it like these people that are seeing it for the first time or who don't know what's what's coming or what happened to get you there, you know? Right. Uh, it's a total different experience. Um, and a, a lot of actors, I don't particularly like to see myself. So I avoid it if I can help it. I like to do it. I like the physical acting. I like doing that. But then sitting there, I squirm and sweat and look at where my hairline has gone to. Or, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't really get into the emotions of it. Mm, you see. See you're so busy checking yourself out that you don't really see the movie. I thought uh, only yeah. girls did that. Wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, the most pleasant surprise is uh, the reason the movie has taken on the life that it has is really you people. That's the surprise. Yes. Is that you elevated it to something that means something and uh, have given it this kind of eternal life. So for right. that... Because we never set out to make a cult movie. I mean, nobody <laughs> ever knew what a cult movie was. Yeah, it was a ever. job. It was just another <laughs> job. You show up. I made a big deal, $400 for starring in the movie. You know, <laughs> and uh, I made more than that yesterday for selling autographs. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 no, I did get above scale. Well, I did too. Scale was two hundred and ninety dollars a week. Ninety dollars a day, two hundred and ninety dollars a week. Well, they bumped me up ten dollars. I got <laughs> <laughs> that was for your agent. Uh, yeah. They were so thrilled that anybody wanted me. But uh, again, you know, you guys are. Are the a, ultimate heroes. No, of you've them. made it a cult film. Yeah. I mean, by going to it, by recommending it to your friends, and by just going to see it more than one time. I don't know anybody that's seen it once. Hmm. You know, everybody's <laughs> seen it multiple times. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Are there new hmm. horror movies that, that you people just are crazy about? Hmm. No. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, Cindy. I was just um, on a panel where they were doing horror movies year by year, and uh, 1999, uh, The Room pretty much was unanimous on The Sixth Sense. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah. But that wasn't really a horror movie. No, but it was a supernatural movie with a horror spirit elements. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Matrix was kind of a spiritual, strange movie. Yeah. That I liked. I yeah. thought it was. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Do they need to be just this? a little off of affording to have like real sets and things to make it an important old, uh, old favorite, you know, it's like something wasn't really, the, the less perfect it was, the more fun. I don't think it's necessarily that. I think that what comes through is the energy of everybody working together and, and a lot of you worked in different films with the same people too, so you, I think you get a bit of that. 
but a lot of these horror movies that they're making now are, are really uh, more about the special effects and marketing and, and all that. Yeah. So you don't get that tremendous energy, not even necessarily starting with that good of a script, it's more what is done with it after the fact. So I think that has a lot to do with it. They don't make them about people anymore, they make them about right. explosions. Yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. I know even in the Gremlins, uh, because of the largeness of it, you only knew the people you worked with directly. And, uh, and even then it was peripherally because they were so stylish that you had your own uh, great place to go and, and dress or a wonderful uh, station. What do they call those huge things you dress in? Honeyway. Uh, Honeyway. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> those are what they call the bathrooms. <laughs> cloistered in a little space running around well, we having had, to work together. We had to be because you never knew when it was your time to be out there. Yeah, so, so <laughs> we didn't rehearse, we just got on and did it. So the, there was a different intimacy um, with the whole cast and crew. I mean, you really had to know who everybody was and what they were doing. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky, you got to eat lunch. I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember. I don't think, I don't think we had a meal break. Before this entire uh, you know, band phenomenon took over, uh, I mean, it's clear that the suits work together uh, or do these conventions and, and you know, get together now. Um, uh, but did you keep in touch with each other uh, in the intervening years after you did the movie? Very sporadic. Yeah, we didn't stay close. I mean, we liked each other and we'd see each other occasionally at, at an event or something. But we hung out with different crowds. Yeah. Also. We, you know, we're married and just beginning families right. and, you know, when you're a, a mother, there's a, a huge percentage of your time. I know I, I cut my working schedule, you know, according to my family. I, I would only do guest shots if they called me. I never really pursued work and if I got, a, a, I couldn't do a series because that was too consuming and I couldn't uh, go uh, on the road with anything. So it wasn't until my ex-husband you know, lost one of his series, and he was always one of those, I'm never going to work again actors. He said, you better go back to work or get a series. And honestly, the phone call uh, to do the Doris Day show came like a few minutes after he said, you've got to go back to work. And it was the, my agent was apologizing, saying, I know you don't want to work. And they know that you have children, and but they would gear their schedule around you, and Doris doesn't like to start till noon, and they just, you know, we would only call you in when you're due on the set, and I said, well, okay, and, and uh, you know, I had a series for two years, and um, it, it was bizarre, so, what did you ask? <laughs> about a career, and, and I think the, the first time we really saw each other was about when Jackie and I, I call him Jackie sometimes, because he used to be called Jackie Hayes a lot. Right, when I was a kid. Yeah, then I, got, <laughs> I got this mommy thing, you know. So, uh, and Jonathan, as you know and love him, uh, when the, the musical little shop came to Los Angeles, they uh, had Jonathan and I go as, as their honored guest, and, and, and I have a picture of us upstairs uh, standing inside the mouth of the plant. These very elegant uh, Mr. and Mrs. First Nighters. Uh, but uh, so you run into each other like you do in the business now and then. But it, it wasn't until these shows happened in Hollywood that uh, we did a few. This is the first out of town event we've done together. So what a good place to do it here. <laughs> And we were not real close friends. We didn't even know each other before Little Shop of Horrors. So. I came from theater world and then went into married world. <laughs> <laughs> then went out of married world. <laughs> 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 then I became the queen of the divorced people. Yes, <laughs> that's another piece of career. If you need any counseling, come to me. <laughs> <laughs> Done this year? 
Anybody else curious have? about anything? We'll answer any question truthfully. <laughs> that's, a, that's a loaded statement. Mm -hmm. What's that? That's yeah. a loaded statement. Right. I guess we got it. Yeah, how about uh, the special effects in Little Shop? Uh, Which uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> that's just a joke in a way, but the, the plant. Okay. When, when the plant got really big, was there somebody inside or was it done with string, you know, wire pulling and opening clothes? If somebody was inside, who was it? Nobody was inside. Working the plant. They did it with, with wires, wires yeah. monofilament. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Griffith was the voice of the plant. He wrote the film. Right. And his grandmother was my mother in the film. Hmm. And his father's in the film, too, somewhere. I can't remember what he did. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Chuck was. Chuck also was in the, the film, also. He got hit by the plant. Right. He comes in to hold up the, <laughs> oh, yeah, the plant. Yeah. He wrote the film. <laughs> That's funny. That was my favorite so part. Got, <laughs> for, for his flat fee, he got to do a lot of things. <laughs> and he was the voice. The voice was great. Yeah. Yeah. You'll answer any question truthfully? Sure. <laughs> Uh-oh. Roger Foreman's Little Shop of Horrors. He's taken a lot of praise, a lot of bows over the years. What percentage of the <clears throat> success of that movie do you give to him on zero to 100? Sex, su success on what level? Financially? or no, um, well, You mean as far as being uh, accepted popularity. by the Popular public? Movie. Well, I mean, he certainly is responsible for getting it together and for financing it. Mm -hmm. And yes, he was a great audience on the set. We didn't get a lot of direction. We got more blocking than direction, okay? Uh, the film was responsible for itself being a success. I don't think that, there was no publicity uh, on the film, I mean, <laughs> It just appeared one day. <laughs> no, it just seems like he made the film. He made it as a second feature, well, a double feature, and the film just took off on its own. It just had a life of its own that still exists. I mean, how many films can anybody remember from that year? One. Yeah. Little shop of you forget Barbie. who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, not only just remember, I mean, remember and like and adore and yeah. want to see again. Yeah. Like the best picture of that year was probably Exodus. But I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, I have to give Roger all the credit for, as, as Jonathan say, casting it, envisioning it, so to speak. And, and having uh, the courage to go ahead and do it. Yeah. But I think it so wasn't... So he gets 100% of the credit for getting the ball rolling, but how well the movie came it out. It was a throwaway thing, I think, that he put together, and he happened to put the, the right people who had, who had a responsibility to their craft, mm -hmm. and no matter what it was, did, did it with their, their energy and, and willingness. And so I think that, that combination... I don't know if you can put a percentage on it. Mm -hmm. I, I know financially, we don't even discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the percentage, you know, went to the producer. That's what they do. And uh, so that's not inappropriate. But uh, every once in a while, we, like, remember we went to that USC Science Saturn Award or something? Oh, yeah. and, and, and so we'd see each other in panels, you know, and, and at first it was kind of golly gee, and then it was kind of, oh, another little shop panel. <laughs> and it was just fun and, and we started thinking how appropriate. So um, now this is wonderfully fun and appropriate doing all this. Right. It makes it all worthwhile having spent those hard two days. <laughs> <laughs> and, and certainly several generations ago. So it, it is rather amazing. And I'm just surprised anybody knows that it's us in the pictures, you know. It's, it's so far removed, but uh, I honestly, I promise, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> we're not just some people who said, let's pretend we're Jackie and John. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good idea. <laughs> right, we should start breaking in a couple of people to yeah. take over. <laughs> <laughs> Judy and Mickey. <laughs> right, yeah. Send them on the road all over. <laughs> We can just thank you for all caring so much, and you know, if you think, you know, if there's anything on earth you want to know while well, we're here this last day or so, but that's why we're here. Right. And thank your, you. Your appreciation and your love is appreciated back, believe me. And return. And return. Thank you.
Thank you.